What's up guys and gals and welcome back to the Nerd Castle. Today in the world of indie games, we're going to be checking back in on the early access of the Hand of Merlin. This is a pretty good tactical roguelike RPG. I actually enjoy it pretty tremendously. Uh, the general idea of this game is that Arthur is gone and his successor is burned out and PTSD'd out from war and aging and getting older. And so you've been given the task of carrying the Holy Grail to Jerusalem uh, while the world is being invaded by corruption and eldritch monsters and everything else. You will take a party, you will guide them across England, into France, all the way to Jerusalem with the intent of dropping the Holy Grail off to stop the impending apocalypse of the medieval world. Now, because this is like the second time we've covered the game since the Early Access came out, I'm going to be skipping some dialogue and some stuff just to get us into the experience a little bit faster, but this game does have metagame progression, so as you play the game, events will unlock new characters, the feats that you accomplish will unlock new patrons. At the beginning of the game, your patron is Merlin, uh, but you can get Morgana, you can get other people to kind of like vouch for you and back your expedition as you unlock them, which will give you new abilities and new ways to approach your problems. Uh, the game has an XCOM-style system of combat where there's like cover but also you fight outside of cover with your melee guys and so anyways this is a really really cool game it's kind of underrated and it's been about nine months since we checked in on it so let's go back on and let's raise some awareness and see if it's something you wanted to add to your wish list or otherwise pass on if after watching this you did indeed want to get in on the early access for yourself i'll have a link for you down below on top of that you'll also be able to find a link to my discord and my twitch stream just in case you wanted to swing on through live there's a pretty good chance on the day that this video goes live i will do a follow-up stream just because like we've only got 30 minutes to play around with here and it takes a good couple hours for this game to really 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 get moving and get you some upgrades and your team starts to get powerful and they start to get badass and so maybe like a follow-up three or four hour stream will help to kind of help people figure out whether or not this is the tactical RPG for them. Let's start a new game. Uh, we're going to play on normal difficulty. I've already, I don't think I've unlocked any of the other patrons. I know how to do it, but I haven't done it yet. Uh, this, because I don't, so there's these things called arcane nodes, uh, and arcane nodes give you essence. Essence allows you to buy new spells on behalf of your patron that you can cast independently of whose turn it is or whether or not they have AP. I don't have a lot of this stuff unlocked because I don't tend to go to arcane nodes, and arcane nodes are where you get the essence from. And unfortunately, that tendency in my play style to stay ahead of the corruption and not go to the arcane nodes has kind of affected my long-term progression. Uh, let's go next. And we get to pick our party here. Uh, we've got Bruinor, we've got Merwin, and we have Morgan. So I'm going to go ahead and add you, add you, and add you. Uh, Bruinor is our frontline fighter. Merwin is kind of a rogue or like a ranger. And then Morgan is a wizard. Although in the case of this game, magic is not altogether that frequent. This is kind of a low fantasy setting. Uh, so he actually is more like an alchemist. He does most of his damage by throwing fire pots and by blowing dust in people's eyes and things of that nature. In we go. Okay, so here we are on the general world map. Uh, there is, like, introductory stuff, and in fact, it's very well animated. Like, there's a big storybook that comes up, and you kind of read from it, and there's illustrations that go along with it. Uh, but I figured we'd skip it so that we could get into the game a little bit faster, since this is, like, a repeated follow-up. Uh, effectively, the game follows an FTL-style structure. Uh, there's nodes. You go to those nodes. Things happen at those nodes. You resolve problems, you resolve issues, you will gain items, you will gain money, you will gain, you know, things to help you effectively on your path. Uh, there are also corrupted nodes. Those tend to be a little bit more difficult. Those are the ones that are going to involve like eldritch monsters and things of that nature. Uh, cities are where you can resupply and where you can buy things with the money and the renown that you've accumulated over the course of your playthrough. For right now, we don't really have that much money. We've only got 34 silver. Uh, we've got 40 renown, which is not bad. Uh, that's how you level up effectively. And then on top of that, we also have food and supplies. Every single time you move on a node, it's going to cost you a little bit of food. Let's go ahead and get moving, I suppose. We'll go to this regular node down here. Passing by the ruins of an old church destroyed in King Vortigern's war against the Picts, you overhear voices speaking of a raid. It seems that a group of bandits is using the church as a hideout. We'll sneak closer and eavesdrop. 
It's impossible to be sure, but the harsh voices echo between the broken walls, and you estimate there are five men inside. They are planning to raid a nearby hamlet at dusk. They seem very desperate and foolish in their desperation. Such men may be pitied, but they can also be incredibly dangerous. Uh, we can alert the villagers, or we can just take them out ourselves. Uh, let's go ahead and deal with the raiders right away. When the men have stopped talking, you step into the ruins. They turn startled, uncertain as to how much you've heard and what they should do. One of them is already reaching for a weapon, but there may still be a moment to prevent bloodshed. Let's intimidate him. All right, so we've got to draw a card from the deck. Hey, and there it is. Bruinor has successfully cowed the bandits. Huh, you call yourselves bandits, you peasant buffoons? Brunor laughs harshly. If you attack that hamlet, you will trip over your own feet and stab yourselves before the farmers will get you with their pitchforks. And if you survive, the men will the king's men will hunt you for sport. They seem frightened by this brave outburst. They stand frozen still for a moment until one of them drops his weapon and bolts. The rest follow on his heels as Brunor chortles. So we got 6 XP and we've got 35 gold right there from robbing some bandits. Uh, let's go ahead and I'm going to take the northern path, I think. The sun shines and a gentle breeze blows as you travel along a pleasant country road. The peaceful mood is only interrupted by the sudden barking of a dog. A large shaggy dog bursts out of the bushes and runs around you in circles barking, but doesn't seem to mean you harm. Uh, let's ask him what he... Let's pet him. The dog wags its tail as you approach and then runs off. It comes back and then runs around again. It seems to want something. We don't have a lot of food, so I'm going to approach. He barks and wags his tail as you approach, then runs off looking back so often to make sure that you're following. You follow the dog to an old, moss-covered ruin hidden in the copse of trees. Just as you begin to wonder why it led you here, you hear a boy crying for help. The dog barks excitedly and leads you to an old well. When you look into it, you see the boy trapped at the bottom. I'm really sorry, I shouldn't be out exploring the ruin, but can you help, please? Alright, we'll climb down. Without stopping to think, you climb down into the well. The boy stares at him, surprisingly calm, but a little confused. How will you get out? I will carry you. Oh no! The well is slippery and difficult to climb. You lose your grip and fall back down again. Okay, that's fine. We got this. We got this. There it is. I knew we'd pull it. With the boy on his back, you climb out of the well. Sweat is running down your back by the time he reaches the top, but he can't help smiling. The moment the boy reaches the surface, the dog throws itself at its master and starts licking his face. They seem to be relieved. Oh, nose wise, this was a terrible adventure. You know how to get home? Uh, he leads you to a small farmstead a few miles down the road where his mother is waiting for him, rushing to the gate as you approach. Edward, there you are. I've been looking for you all day. What did you do this time? You explain what happened, and the mother is unsurprised. She offers you a reward. So there you go. We got a little bit of food, which is good because we don't have a lot of food right now. So, like, we will continue along the road. You are traveling along a pleasant tree-lined path when you come to a fork. To the left, the path narrows, going up a shadowy slope. The going seems more difficult, but it might be shorter. The other path is broad and bright, leading down into a lush valley, at the end of which you see smoke from a chimney. Uh, I'm going down the one to the... Yeah, I'm, I'm going to the one on the right. The valley is quiet and cool. A strong wind blows, and as soon, the low sun is blocked by the trees, causing the air to get chilly. Before long, you hear a melody. You see three damosels playing with a little boy. The child seems oddly pale, but while his eyes are wide with fear, he makes no move to get away. A call to him. You call out to the boy, and the dance stops. The damosels stand aside and allow the boy to walk over, all the while watching him with golden eyes. Once the boy reaches you, he sobs. You lead him down the path so that the strange women are out of sight. Those ladies were not nice. He holds up a torn sleeve. They took my satchel. It had all my best toys in it. All right, we'll go get it. That's what a hero does. You make your way back up the path until you draw close to where the damosels were playing their game. You can hear the music again, though now you perceive it as haunting rather than gentle. The three damosels clad in gowns with hair of silver and eyes of gold stop their dance and turn to regard you. You dare disturb the game? You are brave and foolish. What brings you here? Uh, ask them to return the boy's stuff. And what will you give us for them? There is nothing we need except perhaps amusement. We are bored. I can offer to get naked? Alright, let's do it, man. 
The women giggle in delight as they watch you fulfill your edge of the bargain. The heat burning in your cheeks. Yeah, which one? You accept the boy's satchel from them and make your way back to where he's waiting. Their laughter following you all the way. The boy is overjoyed to have his things returned. Listen, if this teaches us anything, it's that sometimes nudity solves problems. Okay, that's what we learned here today. Sometimes disrobing smooths out tricky diplomatic situations. And we got two food for it, so that's good. Let's go to this note over here. At the end of a long and uneventful day, you set up camp. The sun sets and you light a fire to make food. A figure emerges from the darkness. It's a man, his hair graying with bright blue eyes. May I join you? I will gladly share my supplies in exchange for a place by the fire. Sure, why not? Pull up, friend. The man joins you at the fire and doesn't speak much, but he does share his food. When you rise in the morning, the man is gone. And to your surprise, he has left behind a small pouch of gold. Oh, good. Well, I thought he was going to rob me, so that worked out great. Let's go to the corrupted node. Let's live a little bit. All right, the road over the cliff is silent, but signs of battle are everywhere. Worse still, the air reeks of corruption and decay, and Merlin's spirit warns you that creatures of the cataclysm are nearby. Ready our bow and get... Let's, let's do it. We're going to ready our bow and continue, or we could prepare for an ambush. I don't know. Let's ready our bow and continue. It gives us a little bit of extra range for the first turn or two of the fight. All right, where's the foe at? Let's go find him. Uh, we've got a bunch of terrifying looking spidery wyvern things, but there's only like three of them and a red cap, so I think we're okay over here. I don't know exactly how far they can move, so I'm going to bypass my turn right now. Uh, yeah, and I'm just going to let them kind of close. Oh, they don't know that we're here. Okay, so the game has kind of like a system where you expose yourself effectively. All right, well, move up to cover then. Let's get everybody behind a building. Everybody moves simultaneously in this game, so it's like an our turn, their turn type deal. So you don't have to worry about initiative or anything else like that. Uh, the meters you need to be aware of on these characters, the blue meter is your armor. That always gets damaged first. The red meter is your health. Armor repairs itself after every fight. Health does not. You have to find a healer in order to do that. Luckily, one of Merlin's spells heals us, and then this guy has an ability that patches armor. And so, like, you shouldn't have too many problems, but sometimes things happen. Ooh, they're now wary. Okay, that's fine. They can be wary. I'd like to jump the red cap first, if I can, but I don't know if I'm going to be able to do that. We have very basic abilities right now. My suggestion would be... We can't really get close enough to do what I want to do here. Go ahead and pull up behind cover. And you go ahead and pull up over here. You pull up over here. And we've got two abilities. Archer's Vigil and Shoot. Archer's Vigil is quite literally just Overwatch. I'm going to go ahead and take my shot. Okay, four damage dealt to the armor. They do get a scramble turn, which is a bit of a bummer, but that's the way life goes. Uh, I'm going to step into this gap right here so that he can't get by and hurt my wizard. We're going to go ahead and throw a fire pot on that guy. There we go. So the fire pot has been thrown. Interesting. That was a big old jumpy boy right there. Okay, a little bit of damage out. Every time he gets hit, he gets a little bit more attack power. So it's okay as long as he's the focus of everything that's trying to hit us. Okay, so they're about to put a horror effect on the ground. That means we kind of need to get loose of this. The downside to that is let's play everybody else first and decide what we want to do here. Uh, I'm going to throw another fire pot on him. We're going to focus all of our fire on this guy right here. We're going to scooch her over to here. This guy's behind cover, so we can't hit him just yet. Actually, undo that. You go ahead and fall back over to here. And we're going to keep all of our damage on the same guy that it's been on. You took damage? Okay, I'm going to restore your armor. There we go. Armor's still good to go. And I'm going to leave you in the fray, actually. I don't know what's going to happen with the corrupted gaze. But... I think we'll be all right. 
I mean, I may be drastically overplaying my hand here. Okay, a little bit of damage out. That's okay, though. His armor is still not down, so we're all right. Okay, armor's down, no longer holding. Okay, unfortunate. He didn't block anything right there. Normally, he's a little bit tankier, and he blocks stuff a lot more. Unfortunately, in this case, that has not happened. It looks like he can't actively attack right now anyways, so get back behind cover. It doesn't look like they get an attack of opportunity. You come back behind cover to right here. We'll finish him off. So there's the fire pot. Uh, we do have independent mana, so we can use that right now to go ahead and restore five health to him. Which I think would be a very, very good idea with how we got bursted. It's actually been a while since I played the beginning of this game. I'm used to having, like, a high-level party that's, like, ready to go. And so, like, I, I don't have my utilities right now that I'm normally accustomed to. Uh, we'll go ahead and put her on Overwatch. Uh, don't end the turn. Put her on Overwatch. And then, in addition, we'll fire a shot over at that Wyvern right there. Oh, you missed. That's not great. Wish you hadn't. Probably should have fired at him instead. Let's go ahead and, I guess, bypass it for right now. Okay, we're spreading the damage around a little bit, but I'm sure it'll be fine. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I think that's vaguely workable. Because he jumped, we didn't get a reaction shot, which is kind of a bummer. But sometimes that's just the way it goes. She regenerates armor because of a relic that we started out with. So she should get back like one to two armor per turn. Hephaestion salts is back up so we can restore her armor even more. So there we go. Just keep her a little bit more stout. This guy's got damage that started out on him. So we're going to go ahead and throw that on in there. Uh, Bruinor is ready to ride, so we're going to get him back into the fray. There we go. Ten damage. Used up all of his keen stacks. These guys don't get attacks of opportunity, so don't ever feel obligated to maintain contact with them. Uh, human enemies do get attacks of opportunity, but I think you have to spec into it, if I remember correctly. Like, if I remember right, units do not inherently have attacks of opportunity. They have to, like, purchase it, basically, with skill points. Big hit right there. And an attack out to the wizard, actually. They're spreading it around a little bit. I'm okay with that. Uh, let's go ahead and get Brunor on this guy to finish him off. There we go. The corrupted creature has been slain. We're ready to go with our arrows over here, so we're going to get those going. Perfect. Uh, Hephaestian Salts, unfortunately, can't be used anymore. It only had two charges for this combat. But we are lining up some hits. Brunor is probably going to be fairly scuffed by the time we get out of here. But that's just the way life goes when you're playing this game in the early game. Uh, don't end the turn. You don't really have anything else you can do, in all honesty. I guess set up wide. We'll see if we can maybe bait like a shot. Okay, there goes the shot. He should be okay, though. Let's move him up. Nice, very nice. Okay, so if we don't miss, we've got the kill on this turn. There we go. Perfect. And then Wazard, show him what you got, baby. Perfect. You've defeated the enemy. We got one mana back, and we got ten renown. Uh, and level ups are available. So level ups in this game are really consequential. That's one of the things that I like the most about this game is that your level ups are really, really consequential. Uh, you get game changing abilities when you level up in this game. And so like if we level everybody up using our renown, we get to pick a new ability for each of our characters. Uh, this ability right here, it can be cleave so you can hit everything adjacent to you. You can go with stand ready. Uh, which means that it's basically melee overwatch. Anything that tries to move past you is going to get hit. The downside to that is that they could just ignore you and then you've wasted your turn. The good news is it's free. It has infinite uses. It doesn't cost anything. And so, you know, it never hurts to throw it down. I like lunge. Personally, that's my favorite ability from this first batch. Uh, it allows you to combine move with attack so that he can double attack on a turn, especially early on in an engagement, uh, which can lead to once you've leveled him up and you've actually equipped him with some better gear, 
and some better swords and things like that, it means that he can have a turn where he flat out hits for like 30 damage on an opening turn uh, and eliminates an enemy, thus giving you like a numerical advantage or just depriving the enemy of theirs, which I think is incredibly tactically relevant. So we're going to take Lunge. Uh, Marowin. Marowin can get Sprint. Uh, that allows her to run away and not trigger attacks of opportunity. We can do Specialty Arrow, which is effectively kind of like a... Hollow point arrow. I was going to say a bodkin, but a bodkin is supposed to get through armor, right? Uh, so basically what this does is it just deals a ton of damage to anybody that's armor has already been shredded off. And then right here we can get aiming plus some extra range. Uh, it means that our attacks can't lose. I'll probably go with specialty arrow. Uh, these are randomized. You don't always get the same ones every single time you play thus adding to replayability and forcing you to kind of play outside your comfort zone each time you do a run. Uh, last time I played this character, I think she got a melee stab. She got she got a melee stab, she got sprint, and she got something else. I can't remember exactly what. We should put that on Bruinor. That way that he gets free armor every single turn. Uh, he's got the highest armor amount, and this uses a percentage to derive how much armor you regenerate. Uh, for her, this actually works out okay, too. This is the Bearer of Valor. What it does is it means you deal extra points to anybody that has more health and armor than you. And if they have a higher power rating, which is basically your attack power, you get even more damage. And so that's kind of nice for her. Might also be good on uh, Morgan. But, you know, let's see what Morgan got. Morgan has Flaming Brimstone, which destroys cover and does 4 damage AoE. You can get Blighted. When, take, when uh, taking damage via an ability, restore 4 armor points to the attacker. Okay, so basically we put this on the enemy, and if we hit them, we get armor back. We can also get Hallow. Apply a Hallowing Aura around the caster, generating two stacks of Hallow to allies in a three-tile radius. So that gives plus two damage. That's pretty nice. I don't know which one I like the best here. Um, I don't know which one I like the best. This one benefits Bruinor. This one benefits everybody. But we have to keep a tight formation when we use it. And he can only use it once per fight. So we've got to be kind of careful in our deployment of that resource. Uh, let's go to the regular node over here. We're almost to town. Yeah, two more steps and we'll be in town and we can buy some stuff with our money. You come across a small trading post. Merchants and farmers sit at their simple stands listening as a crier in extravagant apparel extols the virtues of the conjurers and fire eaters. Okay, so they're buying and selling food over here. Yeah, I guess I could buy some food. Why not? Now, we've got to make a tough decision. I want to go to the arcane node, though, because if I go to this node, I really have not been doing any sort of good job getting progression, like, meta resources. So I'm trying to focus on going to arcane nodes from now on so that I can unlock the new characters and, like, the new people that will uh, follow you around and stuff like that. You come to a melancholy place where once stood the castle of Duke Hermel, Garnish of the Mount was a poor man's son, but by his prowess and hardiness, the Duke made him a knight and gave him lands. Garnish fell in love with the Duke's daughter, and she promised her heart to him, but when he found her lying with another, he killed them both. Then, overwhelmed by sorrow, he drove a sword into his chest. They say that after that, Duke Hermel went mad with grief and sought the magic that could restore his daughter to life, collecting relics and artifacts from distant lands, but in the end he destroyed himself in his castle, although the stories do not say how. Now this place is infested with corruption. Without warning, the ground shakes, and the air itself seems to bend, twisting your vision. When your eyes recover, an old man is standing before you, his bright blue eyes glowing with power, his robe the color of the sky on a long dead world. Merlin, he bellows, you're alive. How remarkable. Did Morgana let you out of her trap? The sound of the voice is overwhelming, driving tears of agony into your eyes. I escaped. When Merlin speaks through you, your ears bleed. You fall to the ground. You did, the figure says. Impressive. You were always stubborn. I would enjoy studying you. Why did you not aid me? The figure shrugs. I don't get involved. The universe is too large and too interesting for me to spend my time with your petty struggles. Well, you can't run forever. I can't, he laughs, and you clasp your hand over your ears in desperation. I've been running a thousand times a thousand years, and let's not forget I helped you without my studies. What would we know about the Cataclysm? Nothing. I'm too weak to fight alone. I can see that. 
Even your memory seems affected, and it's no wonder. You wielded so much power to have that shattered, it would have broken me. But for the sake of our friendship such as it is, let me help you recover that strength. Here, your pawns may have this essence. He reaches out his hand and your pain stops. Merlin grows stronger. There we go. So now we have an essence. This means that when we inevitably die and are consumed by horrible purple grape eldritch monsters, we can now buy new spells and stuff when we get back to the main menu. You're welcome, my friend. The sorcerer fades. I'm sure we'll meet again, but watch out for Morgana. She hates you like someone... Only someone who's loved can hate you. Your ears are ringing and your hands are shaking, but your task still lies ahead of you. So I'm guessing Hermel is the other guy that you can unlock to be your patron. Trying to forget the terrible voices, you enter the ruins of the Duke's castle, but whatever treasures may have once been stored here, they are gone. A mass of tendrils grows in one corner as if attracted to something, like earthly plants seek the light of the sun. Somewhere nearby, you hear the abominations of the cataclysm skittering about. Read the scroll? The scroll contains the last will and testament of Hermel, but in truth it's hard to understand. He speaks of seeking a gate to the world above, and discovering it in his horror at finding the paths between the worlds half consumed. He vows to find a way to cross, but regrets the energy required by his spirit for the journey will cause devastation. He mentions ordering the people of his castle to flee. You are forced to stop reading as you are attacked by the abominations. We're a little bit wounded right now, so like I'm like a tiny bit concerned about how this is going to happen. Are they aware of me? They are not aware of me as of yet. We've got more of the wyverns, which is bad because they have that jump ability, which sucks. Uh, however, I'm going to move over to here. I'm going to have my wazard move over there, and I'm going to have my ranger move over here. And then we'll kind of decide what we won't do next time around. I am going to restore his health real fast because I've got a bad feeling that we're going to take a little bit of attrition here. And then we'll go ahead and end the turn. And maybe they will wander into us, thus giving us some kind of advantage. Unfortunately, no wandering has taken place. Uh, let's go ahead and trigger him. Okay, with their scramble turn. It should take them some time to close this gap. So we're going to fall back, and we're going to try to fight them in this back corner. And we're going to hope that the slower ones get isolated with the faster ones. We will also put up a overwatch, I suppose. We have a little bit more room to move this time around. So I think things will be okay. I'm going to heal him one more time. Because I just, I have a bad feeling about this fight. Your overwatch holds, and the turn, let them close. There's the reaction shot. Very nice, five damage out. Reaction shot. Five damage out, very nice. Things are going okay right now. Another five damage. Really, I just need to eliminate one of these guys as soon as possible. So I'm going to go ahead and lunge at this guy right here. There's the lunge. And actually, I can get seven damage plus an extra nine. Yeah, let's do that. There we go. That'll kind of knock them back into each other. Over here, we want one shot to go to you. There we go. We've defeated one of them already. Ah, I think, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Let's bring the wizard up. We're going to throw a firebomb right there to strip the armor so that we can fire the hollow point arrow at you for big damage. Very nice. Which should lead to a somewhat easier cleanup on the next turn. Where are you jumping to? Okay, that's fine. I didn't want all the damage on Brunor anyways. And, like, since they don't lock her down, I'm not that worried about it. This guy's putting out Unnatural Gaze. I don't recall exactly what that does. Okay, he took a shot at the wizard. That's okay. That's perfectly fine. 
We're going to start with the red cap, I would think. Yeah. We'll start with the red cap. Downside here is we don't really have enough abilities to take a double turn on this spot. But what we can do... He should deal enough damage to kill that Wyvern. Okay, Wyvern's down. She now has Mending on her. We're going to keep him right where he's at so that if they move past him, we can lock him down. And we need an arrow to go out here. She still has both of her AP, so I should be able to put up another Overwatch and really, really punish anybody that decides to slightly tactically reposition. And in fact, I'm going to force them to reposition by scooting him back by one tile. It's not going to matter because he's going to use Elusive Jump. But her armor still holds. There's the reaction shot. Okay, and the damage went to Brunor, so like we're still, we're still playing the game out here. Uh, you're gonna go ahead and point blank dash. There it is. He's now defeated. You're gonna lock him down. Although I think the jump gets him out of it anyways, so I don't think it's gonna matter. You pull back behind the wizard. There we go. Nice little opener. Uh, we're going to go ahead and cast Hallow. Should have done that first. Unfortunately, I played out of turn. We're going to use Hephaestian Salts on her to make sure that she is okay to take another hit. There goes the Gash right there. That's good because that's going to give him Keen 1. And there's a little bit more damage to the Wizard. All right. We should be okay. This is going to knock him back against the wall for 8 damage. There it is. Oh, it destroyed the environment, too. Very cool. That's a mighty blow right there, struck by a powerful warrior. And there's the kill. Honestly, that's a fight that we won and took very, very, very little damage, so I'm happy with it. With the beast defeated, you employ the grail to close the wound in the veil between the worlds. Luckily, it's an easy task, as the wound has not festered. The vile growths recede, and there is a chest. Opening the chest, you discover Hermel's relics. It may not have helped him save his daughter, but it may help you save the world. Uh, light boots. They give you plus two to movement, and then you can also use them to get an additional plus two movement. Not bad. I'll take that. Uh, let's go ahead and use our essence real fast to maybe pick up some new abilities. We can get phase, which gives you evading, which allows you to dodge more frequently. You can get warp. Uh, which nerfs the enemy's AP and gives you plus one AP. We've got Translocation, which allows you to teleport somebody. We've got Stasis. Apply two stacks of Stasis to the enemy. Okay, so that basically freezes one enemy. It's a crowd control. Or we can get Thunderbolt, which deals 15 damage but costs two mana. So quite expensive. Like, not, not very cheap. I think I'll take Thunderbolt. Very nice. And now the Outer Ring has been unlocked uh, for the more powerful abilities. I think the ability to tactically deploy 15 damage is going to be huge. Like, I like to think about it in terms of, like, when I play XCOM 2, how many times would being able to basically nuke one enemy for all their health without using any AP on my characters have saved me? And as it turns out with the balancing of that game, it would have saved me in a lot of situations. It would have bailed me out of a bunch of tight issues. Uh, so I, I feel like that's the utility to have. Stasis is tempting, being able to lock somebody down for two turns. But I'm kind of happy with what we've got. You arrive in Kerabrau, the city built by Elbraucus, son of Membrisius, a man of great stature and wonderful strength. Here Arthur held parliament before his war on Rome and declared that Constantine was to be his heir, which never happened. Under the rule of King Dagonet, it has sunken into poverty. All right. Uh, we can explore. Hey, we got the good event. Sweet. 
As you explore the narrow winding streets, you come to a tavern where a knife throwing competition is being held. Sure, let's participate with our archer. It's a 50-50. Ah! I didn't know if I wanted to go that one or the one next to it. Merowyn is unlucky and her knives strike the wall rather than the target. It's always bad luck to hand a woman a knife, the tavern keep says. You never know where she's going to stick it. Alright, there's no blacksmith here, which kind of sucks, because the blacksmith would allow us to upgrade our weapons and our armor and get stronger. The healer, don't think we need it right now. I mean, I guess we could take a light heal, but we can go to the marketplace. Oh, there's the blacksmith right there. Let's go to the blacksmith. And we can choose to upgrade stuff here. I usually focus on damage. That's just me personally. I usually feel like damage is the way to go. Since she's got that extra damage arrow, he doesn't deal damage at all. So, like, we don't really need to worry about upgrading him right now. She's got that really good 8 damage ability, which would become a 9 damage ability. Or he's got the double attack, which would allow him to get an extra 2 points of damage. So I think upgrading him, since I can only afford one upgrade, is the way to go. And then I'm going to upgrade his armor, since he's usually in the fray. Then we'll leave. I don't particularly like that relic right there, so I might sell it at the relic shop. Looks like we've got Caltrips. Deals two damage to enemies on contact. Does not injure allies. Caltrips might be nice. You can only use it once per fight. Okay. What will they give me for that? 38? Four armor on kill is really, really nice. Caltrips is kind of interesting, though. I'm wondering if they take the two damage every time they move across an area. So, like, if they have to move across three tiles that have caltrips on them, do they take six damage, or do they just take the two damage once? And I want to test it, because if they take the six damage, that's an amazing ability. It's really, really good. Uh, let's go to the supply shop. We will spend what looks like 20 gold in order to get three more supplies to carry us to the next town. And then we'll retire. You retire to the Wolf's Tooth Inn to gather your strength for the journey ahead. Okay. I would recommend that we knock out this corruption over here. I don't recall what the heroic node does. It may be worth swinging over there to find out. It does say that it has extreme danger, though. But we can go over there and then come down this way and still get the arcane node. Let's do it. Let's live on the edge for a minute. You've arrived in a town called Galaton. The roads to many small villages and farmsteads converge here, so the market is busy and a good place to trade. Oh, yeah, I don't have anything to trade. Watch out for bandits, Mildreth tells you. Those thrice damn fools have plagued the town for weeks, and they're getting bolder. Mark my words. Just as she says that, the bandits raise the town. All right, well, let's go, let's go fight some nasty little bandit guys. Let's go mess them up, dude. Let's go put some swords across their face holes. Uh, I like to use the first turn just to fall back, in all honesty. That tends to be what I do almost universally. Uh, because they usually start out in such a way that you can't get to them, but they can get to you. And so I usually prefer to hang back a little bit. I don't know if I need to overwatch just yet. They could double move, I suppose. Yeah, we'll overwatch, just in case. Might be a waste, but it might work out. They've got four guys. Okay, so we're going to need to get the archers pretty fast. Otherwise, we're going to get picked clean. They did indeed take the bait. So there it is. Some free damage. I don't know if he'll make it inside the Overwatch circle. Yeah, we only got the one shot, but it's better than getting nothing. Uh, let's go ahead and... Oh, I guess I won't use my charge on this turn. I was going to charge one of them, but I guess not. All right, that's fine. Uh, we'll move up over here. And we will put a little bit of a scuffing on him. There we go. Yep, let him feel it. We'll go ahead and fire right there. 
These guys are in cover, so I don't much see the point in firing at them. There's our kill. I am very curious about these caltrips. I'm guessing that if they move around the caltrips, bad things will happen, but I don't know. Let's just hang tight for a minute. I don't know how the AO. I, I don't know how the uh, AI prioritizes getting out of. Oh, there's a bomb. Oh, that's not great. Wonder if the bomb's gonna affect his own guy. He popped a parry right there, which makes us very unlikely to hit him. And so I'm going to use my charge on this archer right here. It's ten damage. Very nice. And we get a follow-up swing. Once again, very nice. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and have her... Yeah, move over here to dodge the bomb. I, I think that's the big priority. We'll kill off archer number one. We'll move over to here. And I am going to bomb you. There we go. And he's now been giving stacks of mending. He does take damage from his own troops. Uh, so apparently that was kind of like a really desperate strategy right there. I didn't really want to waste my attacks on him. because Oh, it does deal damage for every tile moved. Yo, Caltrips is really good. I've never seen that relic before. He has an ability that he unlocks for leveling up, which is very, very rare, that does this exact same thing. But Caltrips costs no AP. It's a free cast. Like, sweet. Like, hell yeah, dude. <laughs> I'll take it. Uh, let's move over to here. And I would like for you to be injured, please. She is going to fall back this way to get line of sight on this dude. And then she's going to hollow point arrow this guy. There we go. Another one bites the Dusta. Uh, we'll just go ahead and throw a bomb on him. It probably won't be a kill, but he's pretty softened up right now. And he's about to get, like, closed with. So I sort of feel like he doesn't have a lot of options. Oh, never mind. He's going to run back across the caltrips and die from foot penetration. We got a bunch of money, a bunch of renown, so that's great. Let's see here. After the battle's over, Mildreth joins you in the square. You did it! You sent those dung-eating rampallions to cook in the fires of hell. The wretches will spoil the devil's broth. She insists on presenting you with a reward. We can get the Hunnic Arrow. You get Far Striker. Uh... Two damage to enemies that are four tiles away or further. That's pretty good for our archer. That's that's pretty good. Plus two damage is like 100 golds worth of upgrades. What she have right now? The Bearer of Valor? Yeah, I'm going to take the Hunnic Arrow. It's just too good. I've never seen that one either, so that's another goodie right there. Let's jump on into our journal real quick. We'll give her the Hunnic Arrow. And the Grail, it's got its own special slot in your book right here, so don't worry about taking the Grail off. It's not that big of a deal. Uh, but my name is Splattercat. This is Hand of Merlin. Hope you guys liked it. I think this game is really, really cool, and it's come a long way since its earliest demos. Uh, I've had no bugs. I've had no major issues. I like the sound design. The writing is quite good. I like the upgrade paths. I like the up the unlocks, even though I haven't really been focusing on getting them. Um, so anyways, I don't have a whole lot to complain about here. It's a long roguelite. If you're planning on playing a roguelite, this is one where like a run will take you a while. But it is really, really fun. And they sort of circumnavigate that by allowing you to spend your meta progression stuff inside the game rather than forcing you to die and go back and spend stuff on the outside, which is great. It's, like, really, really great. Uh, I think the game is wonderfully thematic. I'm looking forward to the 1.0. But for now, it's time for me to go. My name is Splattercat. I sift through the pile to find what's worthwhile in the world of indie games every single day so you don't have to. Today up on the chopping block, we had Hand of Merlin. Tomorrow we will have something else. Don't forget to leave a like on the video if you enjoyed it. And I will catch you all with some fresh content tomorrow. Bye, everybody.